Welcome everyone. I'm Daryl Kimball, Executive Director of the Arms Control Association. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on progress towards US chemical weapons stockpile elimination under the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, which is sponsored by the Chemical Weapons Coalition, uh, Convention Coalition and the Arms Control Association. Uh, we're happy to host the CWC here at the Arms Control Association. The CWC Coalition is an independent international civil society network committed to supporting the aims and universalization of the CWC and supplementing the work of the member states of the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Now, in recent years, there's been significant attention focused on chemical weapons use in Syria and elsewhere and how the international community and the OPCW can hold violators of the convention accountable, and rightly so. But at the same time, for the past quarter century, the chemical of the Chemical Weapon Convention's existence, the OPCW has been responsible for overseeing the verified demilitarization of vast chemical weapon stockpiles of several states involving nearly 100 production facilities. This has been an enormous undertaking. Of the 193 parties to the CWC, eight had or still have declared chemical weapons stockpiles. And to date, seven of those countries, Albania, South Korea, India, Iraq, Libya, and Russia have completed destruction of their declared arsenals. Syria, of course, was forced to give up and allow for the elimination by the international community of the vast bulk of its declared stockpile back in 2013 and 14, but it's still believed to have a small but deadly undeclared stockpile. Now, the United States and Russia, which uh, once possessed the world's lar two largest uh, chemical arsenals, were originally required to eliminate their stockpiles uh, by 2007, uh, 10 years after the entry into force of the treaty with an option for extensions. And while the US has worked steadily to destroy its chemical weapons stockpile, the process has been more challenging and complex than originally anticipated uh, due mainly to the need to uh, pursue less risky chemical weapons elimination approaches uh, and, and transportation of dangerous chemical materials. So as a result, the, pr the process has taken longer than originally anticipated. And now uh, the United States uh, is due uh, to destroy all of its chemical weapons uh, by September of 2023. And so today we're going to hear uh, from a pair of expert panelists on the status of and progress towards the completion of this historic and important milestone. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from Dr. Brandy Van, who's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chemical and Biological Defense. She'll be speaking to us from the Pentagon today. She has extensive experience in the chem and bio weapons area, including earlier work in her career at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, she's gonna tell us uh, a bit about why the 2023 deadline is important and what's being done to follow through on this commitment uh, and what the, the people who are doing this important work uh, are, are, are doing uh, right now uh, to make it happen. And then next we're gonna hear from Irene Cornelli, who's the chair of the Colorado Citizens Advisory Commission. Uh, that commission advises federal, state, and local government officials and communities on issues uh, relating to the storage and destruction of the chemical weapons arsenal at the Pueblo Chemical uh, Depot. And she's gonna provide an overview of uh, the U.S. Chemical Weapons Disarmament Program and about the role of citizen advisory committees in helping to address public concerns uh, about the program and working with the Department of Defense uh, in, this, in this effort. So after we hear from each of them, we're going to take your questions uh, through the Zoom Q&A function uh, on your screen. And my, my colleague, Paul Walker, who you'll hear from in just a little bit, who's the coordinator of the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition, will moderate that Q and A. So, with that, I want to thank again, Assist, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Van, for taking the time to to join us. Um, and I invite you to begin your remarks. You have the uh, the virtual floor, Brandy. Thank you for being with us. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come speak to you all today. Um, so, the Department of Defense. Uh, understands that meeting our deadlines, uh, the September 30th of 2023 CWC uh, deadline for the destruction of chemical weapons is, is a commitment 
Uh, and frankly, it's a congressionally mandated public law deadline provided to us uh, that is of utmost importance for the national security of the United States. Um, and on behalf of Honorable Deborah Rosenblum, who is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs, I want to assure the coalition here that, that we are doing absolutely everything within our power to support the Program Executive Office for the Assembled Chemical Weapons alternatives, or otherwise known as AQUA team, um, and their systems contractors led by the Bechtel National Incorporated in order to meet that treaty deadline of September 30th of 2023. You know, the ability of the United States to achieve this um, diplomatic objective, frankly, rests heavily on our ability to hold others accountable for also their arms control agreements. So I cannot overstate the imperative of meeting this deadline, which is a priority for us and the administration. However, the safety of the workforce, the safety of the public, and the safety of the environment remains the number one priority for us in this program. Um, and as the Aqua program completes its mission to uh, by the destruction deadline and with various execution strategies, such as um, operating the chemical weapons destruction facilities, as well as the utilization of the supplemental destruction technologies at both uh, locations, it gives us the best safety posture in order to destroy the remainder of the chemical weapons stockpile here within the United States. Um, I'd like to take a moment to commend our partners at the state of Colorado and the state of Kentucky as well as the local elected officials and agency partners for really working with us and working together to support the complete destruction of both the bluegrass and the Pueblo chemical weapons stockpiles. In particular, um, I wanna call out the great work and the collaboration efforts of the community advisory committees. And I know Irene's on here today, you know, it's it's the leadership of those committees and, and Irene, especially there in Colorado, that has led to a lot of our success within this program. You know, on September 13th of 2021, the, the public comment period ended for the Draft Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or otherwise known as the RICRA permit modification, that's going to be issued by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment for the operations of static detonation chambers uh, there in the Pueblo facility. No comments were received during that public comment period, and the PEO Aqua team is currently awaiting the final approval and issuance of that permit uh, modification by CD CDPHE so we can start up the final stages of our destruction. And again, it's it's part and parcel of the relationship that we have created within the sto state and local communities that allows us to, to be transparent and provide the information needed in order to, again, uh, achieve these gains. I also want to call out uh, the great work in collaboration with the OPCW that has enabled inspectors to remain on site at each location, both Bluegrass and Pueblo, during the pandemic to ensure that we have 100% transparency within the destruction process. We have been able to maintain this 100% on-site verification throughout the COVID pandemic here in the United States because of the great work to ensure safety to the workforce, the inspectors, and within the site. So as we continue to keep Colorado and Kentucky congressional delegation, as well as the armed services committees and the defense appropriation committees that we are responsible to informed uh, and regularly uh, engaged within our process and achieving our destruction deadlines, we've had a couple of key things that I'll, I'll bring up to you now. So the effort has strong congressional support and interest uh, as, as expected. And earlier this year, Pueblo hosted several key visits by congressional and Department of Defense and State Department members, senior officials, and staff with oversight responsibility for the chemical demilitarization program. Uh, recently, I personally was able to join Congressman Ruben Gallego and his committee staff for a tour of the Pueblo site there in Colorado and specifically discussed the importance of the chem demilitarization program mission and how that program is impacting United States standing internationally for the prohibition of chemical weapons. 
Um, bluegrass has also had this level of uh, interest by, uh, by others on the Hill as well. So they've recently hosted a couple of separate visits from Senators Paul um, and McConnell focused on the current rocket processing uh, operations and the disposal of equipment there at the facilities after the site completes its official uh, destruction. Needless to say, uh, Senator McConnell was very impressed by the hard work and dedication of the workforce as everybody is when they go out to see these facilities. Um, and is a continued supporter of these efforts across the demilitarization portfolio. You might have also seen uh, recently a House report that came out. It's House Report 4350 in the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 22. And that language specifically is regarding the requirement of the Secretary of the Army to submit to the Committee on Armed Services of the Senate and the House of Representatives a plan to discuss the final closure activities of Pueblo. Um, I want to emphasize that the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, our office within NCB and PEO Aqua intend to remain very closely aligned uh, and in partnership with the Army to provide the requested uh, closure and disposal plans regarding PCAP in accordance with this report requirement. Um, as I stated, meeting these treaty and congressional deadlines uh, are imperative for our national security, while the safety of the workforce and of the environment still remain a number one priority. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you today about uh, about the progress of the aqua program the united states continues to make steady and measurable progress towards the complete elimination of the stockpile i look forward to talking to you today about about that um, but i want to highlight that we remain fully committed to completing the cw destruction as safely and as quickly as practicable uh, and that the united states currently remains on track to meet our completion dates so with that, I will pass it back to Daryl uh, for uh, introduction of Irene. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Brandy, for that, that great overview. Um, it's now an honor to introduce once again, Irene Cornelli, who's the chair of the Colorado Citizens Advisory Commission. Uh, Irene, if you could turn on your video and unmute um, so that we can give you the the floor. There we are. Thank you, Daryl. And, and thank you, uh, Brandy, for your kind words about the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and also uh, about the Citizens Advisory Commission. I wanted to start a little bit today just about talking about the numbers in Pueblo and where we are. Uh, in September 20th, 2004, is when we first began the construction of the facility that is now known as PCAP, the Pueblo Chemical Agent Destruction Pilot Plant. You can see why we call it PCAP instead of that long name. So it's only been in industrial terms a very short time since we began the whole process. And when I say we began the construction, we had an empty cornfield or an empty wheat field that we started with. We have now destroyed all of the 155 millimeter projectiles that were stored at the depot. There were over 780,000 total weapons that were stored at the depot. We've destroyed all the 155 millimeter projectiles. We have destroyed half or a little more than half of the 105 millimeter projectiles. And we are waiting for the final approval of, uh, of the SDC permit in order to destroy, begin destroying the 4.2 inch mortars. And there is just a little over 97,000 of those to be destroyed. I was actually hoping that we would have the final permit approval today. And I can tell you all of that, it would be great news, but I do know that what they're working on is putting it in a workable format, correcting all the grammatical errors, all the spelling errors, but the permit itself will re basically remain as it was in the draft permit that was issued. It's been a long time coming for us to get to this far. 
over 75% of all the agent destroyed is a big accomplishment. Most of it has been done either at PCAP or in the explosive destruction system, which was implemented at Pueblo to begin destroying some of the overpack munitions. We have what I can't say is anything but an excellent worker safety record at the depot and at PCAP. Very, very, very few lost hours of work as a result of injuries. There have obviously been no deaths and there have been no long-term injuries. This is probably better than most of the industrial communities around the world that can say that. The technology that we're currently using is neutralization followed by biotreatment. Neutralization is basically hot water and sodium hydroxide. Biotreatment was a little bit um, concerning by some people at the very beginning. Uh, it has proved to be an excellent technology. It has worked very well. And for those of you who wonder if we had very specialized microbes, the very specialized microbes came from the wastewater treatment facility in Pueblo, Colorado. They were not specialized microbes. So the role of CAC in Colorado, it's a nine member panel established by Congress in the mid 1990s. And the members are appointed by the governor. They are to be representative of the community as a whole and act as a liaison between the elected officials at all governmental levels, as well as the community itself. Our initial task as we looked at it was education. There, because of, of security issues, very few people in the Pueblo community knew exactly what was happening at the depot. Knew, did, they didn't know very much how, how, what was stored there. And so we had to provide education. The only thing that we had knew for sure was the community had decided they didn't want incineration. They also needed to have a technology that would destroy the agent to six nines, 99.99999%. It would be safe for the workers, environmentally safe, could handle the wide range of weapons that we had. And they weren't so much concerned about the economy of whether or not it would be the most economically feasible. They wanted to make sure it was environmentally safe and that it would uh, destroy what they needed to destroy. We hold monthly meetings, sometimes more than monthly. Sometimes they're one-on-one -on -one meetings, sometimes they're you know, large meetings. COVID-19, I'll be honest with you, has made public meetings very difficult and complicated. We are still able to do small meetings in person or on the phone. Our larger meetings all done by Zoom or Microsoft Team. Over the course of the years that we have been in established since 1994, the Citizens Advisory Commission has really become a sounding board. It's a sounding board for DOD and the Department of the Army, for elected officials, for state agencies. We hear a lot of comments. We also hear a lot of rumors. We are able to put out a lot of rumors that are untrue. We have, have had and still have, in some cases, subcommittees dealing with the design of the facility, permitting, which is still active, the biotreatment system, which is still active, and we are putting together a closure committee. When I say closure, I don't mean just the closure of the actual facility itself, which is also very important, but I also mean the closure of the entire military base because there will be no activity, no mission left at that military base. Our accomplishments have included technology recommendations, continuous briefings, the use of the EDS when nobody wanted to use it anymore. And they said, well, they kept complaining, well, we aren't destroying any weapons. And we said, so why can't you use the EDS to destroy some of the weapons there? 
Finally, we won and they lost, so to speak, and the EDS was used for an additional about six months while we were getting the PCAP facility up and running. We have hosted site visits. We have looked at, we have been on site visits to look at emerging technologies, including the EDS and the SDC. We pride ourselves in being transparent. And we, of course, are looking forward now to what happens when the weapons are gone and the site can be turned over to the community. And it's not just the equipment and the buildings, but it's the acreage of almost 23,000 acres. And we want job replacement and we want economic development. I know there's going to be a lot of questions about what's taking so long and everything, but I think I'll stop there and wait for the questions that Paul will be giving to us and then address the issue of what's taking so long later on. And I'll turn it back over to Daryl. Thank you very much, Irene uh, and Brandy, for your remarks. Um, I, I just have to say, uh, after listening to Irene Cornelli's uh, overview of uh, 25 years of, of work with the Citizens Advisory Committee, it's just a reminder that uh, you know good efforts in this field require persistence and hard work, and uh, you've you've just given us a an example of, of why that, that is the case. Um, so let me turn things over to my colleague and friend, Paul Walker, who's the coordinator of the CWC Coalition. He'll be uh, taking and uh, pitching some of the questions that have come in uh, for our two excellent panelists. Over you, Paul, thanks. Thank you, Daryl, uh, very much. And, and also for a special thanks to uh, you and Leanne Quinn uh, and Tony Fleming and our other colleagues at the Arms Control Association uh, for hosting this, the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. Uh, also to Global Affairs Canada, which is currently the, um, uh, the main funder of the uh, CW, what we call the CWC Coalition or the CWCC. And for those of you who don't know, um, the CWC Coalition was created about a, a little over a decade ago now, maybe even 12 years ago, uh, from uh, many of us who uh, in the NGO community had and have been attending the annual meetings and supporting the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons uh, and, and of course the chemical weapons convention uh, in The Hague. And we, we, a decade or more ago, we were very concerned over the lack of public involvement, lack of non-governmental experts uh, really, and the few that were there, very few, probably less than a dozen every year, uh, were all from North America and, and Western Europe. And so we, we organized the coalition to try to uh, help facilitate, encourage, uh, support uh, non-governmental experts from industry, from think tanks, uh, former government officials, former OPCW officials. Uh, and today we have, I think, well over 200 uh, NGOs and NGO representatives all over the world. From, I think it's 85 countries. Uh, and we uh, encourage them, <clears throat> encourage them around the world to, to participate and see if we can really complete the destruction of chemical weapons in a safe and sound and permanent way, and also uh, encourage uh, enforcement of the convention. And as Daryl mentioned earlier, you know we've had issues with chemical weapons used uh, now by North Korea and by Russia uh, as, as weapons of assassination. And we've also had uh, chemical weapons used in Syria uh, by Syria, uh, the Syrian government, and also by ISIS in the past uh, uh, seven or eight years. So, uh, and there are still four countries outstanding from the convention, I might mention. Um, one is Israel, which is signed but not ratified. Uh, one is Egypt, uh, South Sudan, and of course, North Korea, where we know there's a very large uh, chemical weapons stockpile. So I, I wanna thank also uh, Brandy Van and Irene Cornelli <clears throat> for participating today. This is an extremely important topic, even though it sort of flies under the radar, as we say, given all the other issues on our plate today, particularly COVID, uh, but it's related to COVID, of course, and the Biological Weapons Convention is very related to the Chemical Weapons Convention as well. And, and uh, I would note, Brandy, that your position is really for chemicals and biological defense, so as well as uh, Deb Rosenblum's. Um, so let me, let me get on, we've had many questions come in and uh, I guess as Irene and I are well aware, you know, we've, we've been involved in this, I think it's going on almost three decades now. 
Um, when I, I served uh, back in the 90s in the Armed Services Committee, and one of my sort of 100 portfolio items was chemical weapons destruction in the very early years. But back then, we were faced, of course, with an enormous um, Russian uh, chemical weapons stockpile, 40,000 tons, and also with the U.S. stockpile, uh, which had the largest number of stockpiles, uh, had, had uh, or actually the, not the largest, but had, had uh, seven large stockpiles. And the Russians had uh, nine, or was it the reverse? I think it's it's one way or the other. Uh, and Irene got very involved early on uh, with the Pueblo, Colorado stockpile, which is is unique in the sense that it's only mustard agent, where most of the other stockpiles were a mixture. And the bluegrass stockpile, which still remains in Kentucky, uh, is a complete mixture. It's the most heter. It's the smallest, 523 U.S. tons. Uh, most of the others were several thousand tons. Uh, Tuella, Utah was 14,000 tons. Um, but uh, bluegrass is completely heterogeneous. It's got almost every weapon and every agent that one could deal with. And that's why bluegrass Kentucky has, has taken a long time because it's a complicated um, weapons stockpile there to demill. So uh, let me start with <clears throat> a question which has arisen from several several of our participants, and we have over 200 registrants for today's seminar, by the way, from all over the world. Um, the bang question that you referred to, Irene, is why has it really taken so long? And I know, I know this is a complicated question and nobody has the perfect answers to it. Um, you know, we, we in the Soviets back in the 1980s uh, announced that we were going to bilaterally, reciproc reciprocally, unilaterally destroy our chemical weapons stockpiles. And it took a long time during the negotiation of the Chemical Weapons Convention for the Russians and Americans to get moving on this. But, uh, you know, I recall, I recall in the late, mid to late 1980s, uh, just to date myself, uh, the United States predicted that we would be, we'd be finished in about 1994. So this is now 27 years ago, if I count right. Um, and I think the United States has had at least seven formal schedule extensions, maybe even more if you if informally, but you know, it started with 94, went to 97, went to 2000, went to 2004, went to 2007, which is the first official chemical weapons convention deadline. Uh, and then <clears throat> five years was added as allowed in the convention for both the Russian stockpile uh, and the U.S. stockpile. Um, and then in 2011, I think the U.S. said, we're, we're just, just not going to be able to make the 2012 deadline. And they conservatively, I think, said, let's, let's push it back to 2023. So um, let's, let's talk about that for a little bit and maybe start with you, Brandy. Do you want to, do you want to take that um, and see, uh, give us some, explanation as to why it really has dragged on so long? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start it. And I'm, I'm sure with Irene and even your Paul's kind of history and, and understanding of the, the program can, can kind of fill in where, where I uh, don't address things. You know, one of the, the first things that I, I think I'd like to, to highlight is even though folks are saying, you know, it's taken a, a long time and it has, you know, that it, it is very difficult what we've been trying to do, but I want to highlight that the U.S. has officially destroyed 97% of our stockpile, right? Um, so we are only 3% uh, from being completed with, with this initiative. Um, and if we look at, uh, you know, what, what does that really mean? So at, at Pueblo, for example, we've destroyed over 78% of the stockpile there. And at Bluegrass, uh, we're well on the way of destroying over 169 tons of, of the U.S. stockpile in that facility. That includes, at, at Pueblo, 100% uh, of the 155 campaign. At Bluegrass, that's 100% of the 155 mustard round projectiles. Uh, 100% of the nerve uh, agent uh, eight inch projectiles and 100% of the 155 nerve agent projectiles as well. So we have been able to achieve quite a lot in this time. 
Um, part of the reason it's taking so long is the complexity of this stockpile. First of all, um, the, you know, for, for those of you who have watched this for a while also know that there was a total of, uh, you know, nine sites in the U S that, uh, that we had to stand up destruction capabilities for, uh, and in the Pueblo and the bluegrass facilities are the only two that are, are left destroying CW, uh, stockpiles for the U S. Um, the other part that is taken a long time, other than the complexity of, of this destruction campaign, is the fact that we take the environmental uh, aspects of the destruction extremely seriously. We also are taking the safety of the workers and, and the local community extremely seriously. So when we feel in the U.S. that we do not uh, that, that we need to pause and take a moment to ensure the safety of the local community, of the environment, of our workers, then we are going to do so. And we are not going to start operations until we feel comfortable to continue operations again. And that bluntly has, has created uh, the need to, to take some pauses here and there to get things right for our workers and for our uh, local community members and for the environment uh, to reassume operations. Um, as we are getting to the last couple of years of this campaign, um, we, we are taking uh, care to ensure that we understand what are any future risks and, and addressing those well before uh, we might face those, those issues, thereby uh, trying to streamline the process in the last couple of years, again, to ensure that we do make that 23 uh, timeline. So I hope that kind of helps a little bit. I'll, I'll pass it over to Irene to see if she would like to, to respond on that. Yeah, I think, thank you, Brandy. I think there's a couple of other things. You know, the CWC states that, that when you're destroying the weapons, you must meet all of the state, federal, state, and local laws and regulations. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in Colorado, we have a long list of laws and regulations that must be met. And unfortunately, or fortunately, they all lead to the fact that it's going to take time. And we're not just talking about, well, we have to check this box. Sometimes they're required very long and complicated reports. And I'll just go into a couple of the major ones. The National Environmental Policy Act, which every federal agency in the country must abide by. And they might must write an environmental impact statement. The environmental impact statement for PCAP is about 3,000 pages. That just didn't fall off, you know, of a computer yesterday. It was a long time in preparing that. And then there had to be supplements for the EDS and the SDCs. Then we go into the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which is the actual permit that allows PCAP to operate. I have the one for the SDC sitting on my desk right now. It's about, well, all I can say is it's about 10 inches worth of, of paper, double-sided. I don't know how many pages that is, but it's, it's a lot. <laughs> and, all, and again, that just doesn't come off after, you know, just write the thing up and, and, and put it in front of the state health department. There's negotiations. There has to say, no, we disagree with this. This doesn't follow the law. It took about two and a half years to get to the point where hopefully this, by the end of this week, we will have a final permit for the SDCs. Then you have OSHA or the Occupational Safety and Health Act. You have the Multi-Pathway Health Risk Assessment. You have the Clean Air Act. You have the Clean Water Act. And all of a sudden, you have a whole bunch of laws that have to be followed. And that's just at the state and federal level. There are also a few local laws that have to be followed in, in Colorado, for which we hope have not been too onerous, but have occasionally caused a couple of glitches here and there. All of these take time. All of these are important. All of these have helped to protect the environment, have helped to protect the people who live around the depot and work around the depot, which are mostly what I would call agricultural workers, and have helped to protect 
the environment as a whole. And as and for just an in, in the incident about the multi-pathway health risk assessment, they looked at the farmers who live in the area, fishermen who are working in the area and actually have streams to fish in, believe it or not. And all of these things, and they also looked at the lactating mother and at babies, all of which takes time to do these studies, none of which are easy, all of which I think everybody, at least in Colorado, thinks are very important. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Irene. I know we could probably go on for another hour or two simply on the complications, but I would, I would also add uh, and just note that uh, all the other declared you know, chemical weapon uh, stockpile holders, the other what seven, seven countries um, had missed their deadlines as well under the Chemical Weapons Convention in, in a variety of ways. Uh, and the United States um, you know, asked for extensions on all of the CWC deadlines, except for the first, because we started you know, destroying our own stockpile seven years even before the, uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention entered into force. So let me raise with, with you, Brandy, again, the, um, the deadlines. Uh, I, I get asked all the time, and we have a couple questions from this online. Um, the uh, stated deadline under the, at the OPCW, which was agreed to you know, sometime several years ago, uh, is, is the end of September, 2023. It's just about two years, you know, 24 months. Um, the congressionally mandated deadline is December, uh, 2023. And I, frankly, from my perspective, you know, it doesn't make too much difference, you know, a couple months here or there, actually a couple of years here or there. You know, the important thing that you pointed out was to save lives, protect the environment. If it takes a little bit longer, if it takes a few more, you know, million or billion dollars, so be it. Uh, but what's, what do you think, which of those deadlines do we have to deal with? Probably both, I assume in different ways, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so from a, um, a statutory responsibility, of course, we have to we have to watch the uh, the December thirty first deadline, twenty twenty three. Uh, that is what Congress has told us to destroy things by. However. Um, what we really work towards is the September uh, deadline, uh, as stated in the CWC. Uh, and everything that, that our programs and our planning within the Aqua program within NCB is, is specifically focused on meeting the September deadline. Um, we are we're continuing to work with our you know, state local regulators, with the community, uh, with the Aqua PEO to ensure that, um, that we are going to make that deadline. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in my statement, you know, we're, we're doing risk mitigation, you know, every single day, essentially. We're watching where potential risks will come up that will either uh, be related to our, the safety of the workers, community, and environment, or also within the, you know, uh, we, we sit in NCB in the acquisition and sustainment domain. So we've got a bunch of program managers that are also watching programmatic limitations or potential issues and risks. Um, and then we mitigate them as, as early and quickly as and efficiently as possible, all with the eye on making that September 30th deadline for 2023. That's great. Good to hear. Um, Irene, could you give us some of the, um, some of the, the real uh, challenges in dealing with the public? I know the, the U.S. program has oftentimes been criticized for being almost too public and too inclusive and, and too much citizen involvement, dealing with state regulators and permitting processes. And you pointed out, you know, the 10,000 pages of all our environmental statements and, and permit processes and the like. And we're dealing with the permit process right now at Pueblo on the static detonation chambers uh, and to what extent the throughput, you know, will meet the need and, and the like. So um, what, do you, what do you think? Do, do you, do you agree with the critics that we've had too much involvement or would, would the process have been quicker if we had almost no involvement or, or is that even, would that have been even feasible, right? Um, 
number one, I don't think the process would have been any quicker if we'd had no involvement. I think we, it, with the process would have been different. We would end up in a lot of federal courts instead of having public meetings that would be friendly and sometimes not so friendly. You know, let me point out, when we first, when I was first on the CAC, which was in 1995, we had public meetings in rooms that held four to 500 people, public people, not workers at the depot or anything else, public people that would come out. Sometimes they wouldn't say much, but they were always there. Before the COVID shut down our, our big public meetings, if we had 10 public members that came out to the meetings, that was a good public participation. And I asked somebody why, and they said, because they trust the CAC to get things done. And when they have questions that they can come to the members of the CAC, one of the members, all of them, depending on their point of view, and they can get the answers and then they can move on and they can go to their kids' baseball game in the afternoon as opposed to a Citizens Advisory Commission meeting because they trust us to get it done. And I think that is probably an excellent commentary on public involvement. You can go to the websites, you can go to CDPHE website, you can read every single word of the permit if you want to. You don't have to, and very few people do, but it's there if you want to read it. You can read every word of the environmental impact statement if you want to. And there are public repositories where you can reach, read them as well as you don't want to go to a website. So there are lots of ways to participate beyond just attending a public meeting. But I think it's been very important to tell people, if you want to know the information and you want to read it firsthand, be our guest. It is not difficult. It's not hard to read. And eventually you come to the point that you understand what has to really be read and what you can skim over. Because how many times can you read the 10 pages to tell about where Pebble Chemical Depot is located? So, but I think it's important though, to the public to know it's available. And to know that we as members of the CAC are available to talk to them. I can't tell you how many times at seven o'clock some evening, I've talked to a public member and says, what do they mean by X? Yeah. And usually you can walk them through it and they say, oh, that makes sense. Bye, have a nice evening. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's excellent. And I think that's the way it should work. I don't think there ever is too much public involvement. Good. Would you agree with that, Brandy? Absolutely. And, and I think that um, the transparency that we can provide from the, the Department of Defense and from PEO Aqua to the community members, to the general public, is of the utmost importance, right? We, we are transparent about what we're doing, both uh, domestically and to the international community. Uh, and we want to continue that. Uh, and, and Irene has brought up in a number of occasions uh, you know, that sometimes we have a tendency to speak a little bit too technically, right? And so the idea that we can translate, you know, some of the tech talk into, in, into uh, you know, plain language, uh, it actually helps us do a better job at communicating and, and having folks like Irene at the CAC and the, and the Colorado, uh, Colorado CAC, the Kentucky CAC, coming back to us and saying, you know what you're saying doesn't make sense to the broad public. Can you please rephrase? And we go... Oh yeah. Okay. So let's, let's rewrite this. Let's, uh, let's hold a meeting. Let's talk through some of, some of these concerns and these issues. And I think that that level of transparency, both, uh, both here in the U S as well as with our, uh, international partners and allies, uh, and the, and then the broad international community just helps everybody understand where we are, what we're trying to achieve. And frankly, uh, highlights the importance that we feel that this program and the and the international community has for the the chemical weapons de demolition. Great, um, I, I have once again I have I'm, I'm sort of triaging questions here. We have a, a large number of them, but I have an interesting one that I think is a good follow on here from uh, David Koplow, uh, who some of you I think you both know here in Washington D.C. And he's he uh, I'll I'll just paraphrase it. Um, a lot of the debate over the years 
um, Irene, you know this very well, I'm sure, you know, has been how do we best protect the environment? And the, the original proposal was to, of course, you know, move chemical weapons, you know, to three centralized incinerators. And that was shot down pretty quickly, particularly by Congress, given the risks of movement and leaking weapons and, and the like. But the next proposal really was to build an incinerator at every, you know, one of the world's largest, most sophisticated and scrubs incinerators at every site. Do you think if we had gone the incinerator route uh, or originally, and we're, we're thinking back now to the late 1990s, I think, um, that we would have finished earlier or not? And thank, David, thank you, David, for the question. Uh, Brandy, my, or, my Irene, personal, if you want, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, my personal opinion is no, we wouldn't be finished any quick, more quickly. Yeah. First of all, if we did an incinerator in Pueblo, for, it was heavily opposed, number one. Number two, we would not have been able to do some of the unique, environmental and permitting processes that we did in order to begin construction of the uh, PCAP facility prior to even knowing if it was going to work. And that is what we did. We began construction when we were still designing the facility and designing the internal workings of it and making sure it would work. You couldn't do that if you had a, had a uh, operational, at other sites, incinerator, like we had at Tuella or in a JCADS or every place else that we had an incinerator. You would have had to wait until everything was on the line. The RECWA permit was approved before you could begin construction. RECWA permits take a long time to approve. And just the very small SDC permit which was a considered an incinerator permit in the state of Colorado, it took about three and a half, about three years. You can imagine for a large facility like would have been an incinerator where PCAP is now, it could have taken five to six years in order to meet all the things. So while we would be maybe ahead in getting a permit you wouldn't have been ahead in construction because construction, no matter how much money you put to it, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much time that it takes for concrete to dry and all of these other things. So you cannot necessarily speed construction. So I think we'd have been about in the same place. And many years ago at a CAC meeting, there was even a gentleman who was at one of the meetings who indicated that he didn't even think that they should start Pueblo until this year, 2021. Wow. When I asked him, well, what about the treaty and all these other things? He says, who cares? Yeah. Now that's a cavalier way of looking at it, but I think that we would have had a lot of problems getting a full blown incineration permit through in the state of Colorado before we, it, before construction could begin. So I think that we would be in the same place. Yeah. Brandy, do you want to add anything at all? No, I mean, I, I, I think Irene covered it pretty well. And um, I, I agree with her. I think that it's, it's um, very difficult for me to, to see how we've, we've worked through the alternative methodologies and, and try to liken it to how we would get the incineration done. But based on what we know about the incineration activities and what we know about our current facilities, I absolutely agree. I, I don't think that we would be in any different place if we would have gone through incineration processes because of the permitting, because of the, the safety and uh, and, and the environmental regulations that we have to adhere to in each one of the states in these facilities are operational. It just, uh, it, it doesn't seem like it would be any different. Yeah. Um, here's a question from um, Craig Williams to you, uh, Brandy. It says, under, under current, and some, a lot of you know Craig, who's uh, I think co-chair of the uh, Citizens Advisory Commission in Bluegrass, Kentucky. Uh, under current law, the decisions associated with closure are delegated to the secretary of the army and the governor or the state governor of the state. Uh, what do you see as the role of the department of defense in the closure decision-making process? Yeah. So, um, so let me, 
let me take a step back and explain why why that is that way. Uh, so the the chemical weapons destruction facilities that that we are talking about, both Bluegrass and Pueblo, are actually located and operated at U.S. Army installations, and the Aqua program sites are actually considered tenants on those army installations. So in addition, the environmental permits um, are with the army installation, not with the, the aqua program itself and the contractors who operate the facilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, the, uh, how the office of the secretary of defense works with the army though is um, essentially hand in hand. We within NCB who are operating and overseeing the Aqua program work directly with uh, the Army and then the state environmental regulators to ensure that com- com- the closure, excuse me, uh, and the destruction of the facilities is done safely and effectively. We've got an office here within uh, ANS, which is kind of a partner office two hours, which uh, which is in the sustainment office specializes in uh, facility closures. And so we have partnered with them and with the US Army to ensure that the, that the closures are done in, a, in, in the most effective manner and the most supportive, again, for the, for the local community. But it is, uh, it is a little bit nuanced, right? And of course, uh, in addition to that, the Aqua Program Executive Office is sitting within the Army. Um, so it is done within partnership with the Army with an, an OSD, um, and we work hand in hand to ensure that the closure of the facility and then the, the handover to the local community is completed. Great. Thank you. Irene, do you want to add anything at all? Well, the only thing I would add to it in the case of, of Pueblo, they are have a, a rather unique situation because they are the base re- realignment and closure commission from 1988. And of course they didn't close it as a result of the 1988 closure and they couldn't because they had their weapons stored there. And at least Congress at that time knew that they couldn't destroy the weapons in seven years, which was probably a good decision to their part. <laughs> but so our, our uh, closure is even more complicated because not only are we closing a facility, the PCAP facility and the SDC, or SDC, yeah, SDCs, but we're also closing the entire base and how that will be done. And that's why uh, Brandy in her very opening remarks alluded to the information in the NDAA, the, the article or section 4350 concerning specifically Pueblo because it's, it's trying to take into consideration some of the uniqueness under the BRAC policies and under closure for Kim Demille. Great, great. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a couple of questions here that ask specifically about Pueblo. Irene, I'll pose these to you first. Um, and what, what specifically is being done now at Pueblo? I mean, what you mentioned this, I think Brandy did too a bit. Uh, which campaigns, uh, what weapons, what agent, uh, and what's left to be done, um, and where, did the, where what's the status of the SDC, I think, of the static detonation chambers? Okay, the status of the uh, SDC, the static detonation chambers, is we're awaiting the final approval of the permit, which I was hoping would come today, but it still may come later today, maybe tomorrow, maybe on Monday. That's where we are in that, at which time then the SDCs can begin their ramp up process to destroy the uh, 4.2 inch mortars. And they will be used exclusively at this particular time, the SDCs, three of them, to destroy the 4.2 mortars. I did the math about I don't know, a couple of months ago, concerning what, depend, based on the fact that you would have uh, so many weapons that could go through on a 24 hour basis. And would we be able to destroy all the 97 plus, uh, 97,000 plus weapons for the 4.2 mortars in the time that we would have left? And we did the math, this came out and I said, no, this isn't right. And then I realized that you had to multiply it by three because we had three different SDCs, but we can indeed get it done. And so that is a good thing. 
Right now we've completed all the 155 millimeter projectiles. They are gone with the exception of a few that are left that were uh, leakers and overpacks. I think there's less than 300 of them at this particular time. And we are over halfway done with the 105 millimeter projectiles and they are being done in the main PCAP facility. It is estimated as if that things go as they are currently going with the, the 105, we should be done with them, I'm saying sometime in early summer of next year. That means that we can begin closure of some of the PCAP facilities as early as summer of 2022. So that's where we are right now. The, the workforce has been very clever about dealing with some of the problems that they've had with stuff bursters and everything else in uh, with the 105s and even the 155s in, in, in removing them. And they've got a special little tool that they now use that, that will put a little extra torque in the, in the process in order to remove the bursters and the stuck pieces. And that's helped a lot. Uh, we also have, of course, as is in the case of all mustard agent weapons, problems with the fact that the weapons are very old. And sometimes you just have problems that no matter what you do, they leak, they burst open like we don't want them to burst open. And, and so sometimes it requires a little bit of cleanup. But since we have three different uh, trains going at the same time, so to speak, we never have all three down at the same time. So we could always continue to use two or even one of the same trains while we're cleaning up from a, a, an environmental spill. So I think things are at this point going very well. The biotreatment system is going very well. We are not shipping off anything except brine to a, to a local Colorado landfill. And so that we're very happy about. And by the way, we are shipping off all of the cleaned munitions to a place that use, re, will recycle all the metal. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Brandy, do you want to add anything at all? No, I mean, uh, Irene covered it for 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 Pueblo quite well. Um, I mean, we can we can go into to bluegrass if you'd like, but uh, but Irene is the expert here <laughs> when it comes to Pueblo status. Um, let me ask you both. Uh, start with you, Brandy, too. About we talk about closure and uh, finishing the process over the next couple of years. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, I, it seems to me, has been offsite shipment. Um, I know, particularly in Bluegrass and Pueblo, but in other sites too, the communities have, have wanted to keep everything on site, be treated on site. You know, we, we bore the burden, the risk, and we'll, we'll bear the demilitarization challenges and, and the like, that sort of philosophy. Um, and I know there's offsite shipment from both Bluegrass and Pueblo of various materials, mostly dunnage, I think, and in in, in dunnage, which is a reportedly not impacted by a live agent in any way. But is, is offsite shipment still a problem uh, for both sites? And, uh, and I know the offsite shipment typically goes to Port Arthur, Texas, which uh, the Veolia site down there, which is a bit of an environmental justice issue as well uh, for incineration. So I'm wondering if you both would like to speak to that at all. And will we have more offsite shipment in the future in the next two years? Uh, Brandy. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a good question. Um, so, so the, I guess the the thing that I will say, uh, or that I'm can say at this point is, when we talk about the offsite uh, shipment, you you are exactly correct. Nothing that is shipped offsite uh, is is exposed or or contains any kind of chemical weapons, right? So, going back to what Irene was saying earlier about you know, state and local laws, uh, federal laws, uh, it prevents us from, from shipping anything across uh, state lines that are actually uh, munition fills. Um, so, so what is shipped offsite is, is those um, supplementary uh, 
metals, uh, et cetera, that have been already washed, have already been decontaminated, cleaned, and, and are, are being uh, moved to either go into a recycling program or, or uh, incinerated uh, for other, other means. Um, will we continue to see offsite shipments? Um, you know, that, that is a, a potential, but again, none of it would, would ever uh, actually be a shipment of a projectile, a rocket, or a mortar round, uh, or any kind of uh, CW fill uh, munition. So, um, Irene, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Irene? The whole issue of offsite shipment goes back to education. What I mean, it goes back to the very one of the fundamentals I learned in in uh, you know general science back in ninth grade, which was a long, long time ago. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. You are going to get things that you have to ship off site. The question becomes, where do we want to ship them? And as I said, our brine and, and salts and that type of thing is shipped to a landfill within the state of Colorado. They build special cells just to accept this kind of shipment. So we feel, well, okay, we're keeping it within the state. The last time we had a, a, a major concern about the shipment of hydrolysate was at the very beginning of the pandemic. And the uh, Centers for Disease Control came down to Pueblo and said, you've got to ship this, all this hydrolysate up to a certain point off site. And of course, some of us said why. And, uh, but I learned a long time ago, you don't try and fight the CDC because you're not going to get anywhere except a headache. So I, you just left it at that point. Since that time, there has been no need to ship off hydrolysate. I do not at this time anticipate any need to ship off hydrolysate because of our fact that our biotreatment system is working perfectly well. And we ship off the metal parts to a metal it, that have been treated and can decontaminated to a recycler. And many of you have been with this program long enough to know water-wise, we were very insistent from the very beginning of the aqua program that we wanted to recycle as much water as possible. We have been very successful in recycling the water into our system so that the fact is now we have about 80 to 85% of the water is recycled into our system. The rest is through, you know, basically, you know, evaporation and everything else. So we feel that we have done the best we can in keeping our emissions, and I don't even mean just air emissions, but I mean all of the extra things that come off, all the wastes that come from the process on site. Oh, that's great. Let me read a comment first that's come in from a colleague and a CWC coalition member, Dr. Detlef Menish, um, who's uh, been very active in the ICCA, the International Council of Chemical Associations. And, he just says here, uh, we, we, the ICCA, represents 90% of global chemical sales and is in full support of the spirit and goals of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, check uh, iccs-chem.org or manishconsulting.com. So thank you, Detlev, for that comment. And here's a question from um, Rich Guthrie, who's a colleague of ours, Dr. Richard Guthrie in uh, Britain. And he says, a major contributor to the challenges of the US CW destruction program is that the weapons were not designed for dismantling. Um, and I thought, I think all of us have talked about this over the years. Has the Department of Defense learned lessons to ensure that all new weapon systems of all types are designed to be dismantled in a safe manner? Basically, this, this gets back to you know, the whole question about uh, greening the weapon systems, if that's a possibility, it's sort of a contradiction in terms and somewhat, but, uh, or um, cradle the grave, you know, design of weapon systems. And I think it's an important, uh, probably unaddressed question to a large extent, but an important issue in the future of, of military operations around the globe that these weapons, we know the Russian, the Amer less so the Russian, but certainly the American weapons were never designed to be taken apart. And that's why part of the reason I think historically why it's been so expensive and so dangerous uh, and so time consuming uh, to try to handle these weapons as opposed to dumping them as we did up until, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. 
Um, Brandy, would, could you take that question? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I guess the first, uh, let me make sure that I, I highlight and, and am very clear that the U.S. doesn't have any future uh, CW filled munition plans. Uh, and and so we're from a weapons system perspective, we're not talking about chemical weapons here. Um, in terms of broad uh, lessons learned, you know, absolutely. The U.S. is always watching uh, for, especially within the Department of Defense, for opportunities to make things much more safe and effective uh, for for future um, operations. You know, be they uh, demilitarization or dismantling activities. Uh, or and especially uh, looking at again environmental safety regulations laws and just best practices. Um, so so whether or not it's it's specifically you know uh, you know pulling the thread between this program and the in the demantling of the uh, projectiles and the munitions to you know to new weapon systems it's it's probably a little harder to draw a direct line uh, but there's always lessons learned in this types of process and uh, the the aqua team has been really good at providing information back to both the the congress as well as to osd on what have been the complexities of this uh, dismantling process as they achieve each one of the different types of munitions and especially those that have been degraded for so long um, so that we can ensure that if there is ever another time in which we have to dismantle or do demilitarization activities for chemical stockpile, we, we have those lessons learned and that we can uh, utilize in best practices for the future. Yeah, great, thank you. We have, we have as I say, a, a number of uh, questions still. And I think one of the questions, we go back to closure or conversion is from a, a colleague named uh, Luis Cavallo uh, from Portugal. And he says, are there any plans for future utilization of the destruction plants? I suppose he's referring to, you know, the incinerators, the biotreatment plants, the, the dismantlement, the robotic thing, the STCs, the EDS, uh, after the total elimination of, of the American stockpile. Uh, Brandy, go to you first, I guess. Uh, yeah, so um, as we as we are looking at dismantling the the facilities after we're done, you know, by so first of all, to, to again reiterate that the negotiations actually for how the facilities will be left is ultimately between the U.S. Army and the the governor um, of of the states. So um, they are currently working through what is uh, supposed to be left behind versus, uh, you know, uh, destroyed completely by the law. However, um, the intent is to to raise the facilities, uh, to, to completely dismantle the static detonation chambers, uh, incinerate what, what we can, ensuring specifically that anything that has touched uh, the, the chemical weapons are cleaned and decontaminated or destroyed uh, to, to an appropriate level as per uh, US EPA guidelines and then state and local regulations. Um, anything that is uh, left thereafter, of course, is, uh, you know, in terms of the ground itself, the, uh, you know, the power, the water facilities, et cetera, et cetera, that, that's what becomes a negotiation between the, the, uh, the local communities as well as the US Army. Um, but, but it is written into law, it, is, it will be provided to, uh, to the general public, what are the plans, uh, especially as it relates to Pueblo, as uh, Irene mentioned earlier, um, especially with them being under a BRAC. Um, and I did see the note from, from Craig, uh, so I'll clarify your, your question on uh, acquisition and sustainment. So the office that's within acquisition and sustainment that will be helping or is helping with that is one called OLDCC. So that stands for the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation. Um, and they are the primary office that assists local communities that are impacted by DOD program changes. That includes things like base realignment and closures, 
uh, or program stops and starts. So that OLDCC organization is directly involved in the negotiations, or I shouldn't say directly involved, but they are directly supporting those negotiations between the Army and then the local communities and supporting the local communities and identifying any potential uh, support or or essentially market surveys for future work within those facilities, not within the facilities, within the local community, excuse me. Right, right. Yeah. Looks to me like we've for some reason lost Irene here. Are you there, Irene, on audio? No, I don't, I don't see her at all. Um, Craig has also pointed out, uh, Brandy, um, while we have you here, that um, Bluegrass Kentucky operations have now been stopped because the hospitals are filled with COVID patients. And it, it, it's really, I was actually surprised to see that. Um, and it's an indication of the relevance, I think, of, of the current pandemic to major operations such as this, when we have enormous requirements for emergency preparedness and handling yeah. potential victims of any sort of accident that could happen, even though it's not happened to date. And I don't, none of us expect something will. But yep. um, what do you think could be done about bluegrass if, yeah. Stop so, missing a very tight deadline here. Yeah. yeah. So, so it is concerning, and it is something that we're watching. Um, you know, COVID has put a strain on on all the operations across the U.S. and, and globally. Right. Uh, it's impacted our day to day lives, uh, and it has, you know, uh, impacted, thankfully, to a minimal degree, the operations both at, at Pueblo and at Bluegrass. So on September 20th of, of uh, this month, so just a few few days ago, three days ago, the Madison County Emergency Management Agency there in Richmond notified uh, Bluegrass that all of the hospitals in Madison County were currently unable to support any potential chemical, most probable events or MPEs, right? Um, and that they were severely degraded in their ability to treat any serious industrial accidents. So an MPE scenario requires uh, a hospital and emergency room support from the local community. So, so this is this is why essentially uh, the um, BGCAP had to had to halt operations. You know, the sudden rise of COVID uh, and related illnesses in local hospitals has absolutely resulted in triggering of these kind of limited operations, um, and. The LCO condition, uh, as we were notified today, actually has passed, and the plant is is able to start up um, previously scheduled maintenance. Right, so we are able to go in and do maintenance during uh, this pause and uh, in in destruction before we actually start resuming again. So, so that is actually a positive note. Um, I'll also say that, you know, even with all of the CW, uh, CDC uh, guidelines and protocols, our teams have been phenomenal at being able to continue to operate in this COVID pandemic. And there's, when you look at the whole of it, there's been very minimal impacts to the program overall, extremely minimal impacts to our performance, our schedules. But as always, you know, COVID remains a concern. You know, we continue to look at our, our risks in, in COVID and adapt and adjust and doing things like uh, working on scheduled maintenance when you have to slow down because of a, a local community, not being able to support the, uh, the potential hospital um, and MC, MPE activities is, is, a, is a great way for us to continue operations that would have to be paused anyway for scheduled maintenance, but not actually lose any time on our schedule. And that's also important to, to note that within our schedules, we build in these buffer times for operation or, or activities such as, as this shutdown. Um, so uh, we do always know that there's going to have to be adjusting work environments and work routines, and we are going to continue to provide maximum protection for our workforce while still maintaining the schedule plan. So that's great. I just hope that Kentucky seems to be a fairly unique state as far as COVID is concerned, maybe one of the highest rates of infection, yes. I think, in the country, <clears throat> along with some of the deep south. So I, I hope that doesn't more impact, you know, more impact the whole process. 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's another reason why we, we take a lot of our safety measures uh, seriously, right? And, and watch and, and have conversations with, with the workers about the importance of maintaining, a, you know, safety and, um, you know, social distancing and, and masking as much as possible possible and we're always watching the local environment uh infection rates to to make sure that we're uh being safe right and it's it's yeah. been a heroic effort on behalf of the the teams that are there to to ensure uh the health of the teams on the on the ground and, and it's amazing we've we've made you know as much progress as we have under you know 18 months of covid so absolutely not i mean not only the the operations at the sites but again uh, making sure that that we have the inspectors 100% uh, available there at the facilities. The the dedication of those teams, both at Bluegrass and at Pueblo, has been absolutely phenomenal. Great, great. Uh, I'm going I'm to uh, pose a question here from Michael Lima. You may have seen this in our list here. Um, he says, uh, what are the subsequent major initiatives for the U.S. Army Chemical Materials Activity? I know what we call it these days, it's all the different acronyms up in Aberdeen, Maryland, but uh, after completing the destruction of chemical wep- the chemical weapon stockpile 23, I'm sure there's still, there's still an enormous amount of activities to go forward with. Yeah, so, so yes, because even though we're, sh- we're closing out the AQUA program, there, there are still activities that are, that are underway. Um, and one of them that, that I'll call out here is the Recovered Chemical Weapons uh, Program, right? Um, and its acronym is RCWM. And it's called non-stockpile. Not the non-stockpile, right? Okay. So, sorry, or buried, yes. or buried, or buried chemical. Those aren't the official terms. That, that's that's exactly right. So so that program will remain uh, in in the U.S. Uh, it, for for at least the time being, right? In case there is ever a a chance that uh, some non-stockpile, uh, you know potential fill is identified, then this program is available to go out and, and properly um, uh, extract and dispose of any any types of uh, munitions or again, it doesn't even have to be a munition. It's just, you know, there's, there's things that people find uh, that they think might be a munition. This team is the one that actually goes out and, and gets it. So. Yeah, I've, I've actually worked with, with them over the years when they were called, I think, non-stockpile program or Yep. activity and um and of course the the big you know example we all cite is the spring valley program in washington dc that's right which has been going on for you know finding world war one buried chemical munitions in northwest washington uh amongst you know over a thousand beautiful homes up there in american university so that's that's been uh an enormously complicated difficult process um but i know there are there was something like 200 uh, suspected burial sites in the United States. And then, of course, we have sea dumped chemical weapons off the both coasts and Georgia's fishing bank and out of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. So that's that's probably a major issue. And a lot of us have argued that we should expand that process of surveying and just cleaning up, even if it's even if it's a, just a small, um, you know, samples of, of live chemical aging from World War One or something really needs to go forward. And we also have sites in foreign countries like Panama, for example, where you know we left chemical weapons behind. So that yep. that I hope could be an expanded program once we cut back on our billion or two billion dollars a year, you know, uh, defense authorization yes. program. It, well, yeah, it's it's quite an investment. You know, uh, it's it's I think it's over thirteen billion dollars in counting for Bluegrass and Pueblo alone. So. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah, and I see Irene is back. So Irene, welcome back. Thank you. You know the variabilities of the internet. Every once in a while, just sort of gets you where you don't want it to. So. Well, we're coming down to the last few minutes anyway. So you, sure. didn't, you didn't you didn't miss a lot. You were only gone a few minutes, but thank you for trying to uh, get back and thank uh, Leanne. I think uh, uh, from Arms Control Association for hooking you in. Um, let me, it's now, yeah, it's really closing time, but let me ask both of you for just some closing comments. I mean, this has been enormously informative. Uh, I really thank you both for your time and, and also all your efforts over the years and all your 
colleagues, you know, in, in the Pentagon, Brandy, and, and in the CAC, and in Pueblo, Colorado, Irene. Um, but uh, can you give any final comments of things we've missed that you think are important that you might want to raise? I mean, that, I have loads more questions, but we just don't have more time. And I apologize to everybody who, whose question wasn't specifically asked. But why don't we start with you, Irene, about any final comments you'd like to make? Sure, before my internet decides to go haywire again, what can I say? Right. Quick while we still have you, right? Yeah, that's right. No, I actually, it'll last for quite, you know, it might last for days now, so who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's been, as it, 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 Paul knows, and he and I have been working on this issue for many, many, many years. And it's difficult to think that we're actually coming to the end, or it's actually good to think that we're, it's coming to an end and that we're, minding, we're gonna finish it within our lifetime. I don't think that Paul or I ever thought that this would be a, a, a lifetime commitment, but uh, it has been in many ways. I think the people that have worked on this program through the years have been excellent, Although we may have disagreed at times, we all know that in the end, we had the same goal in mind, which was to destroy the chemical weapons. How we got to the end game sometimes differed. And uh, that's where most of the issues have come. We had a colleague a long time ago that said that this is 10% technology and 90% politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that still remains the case. All of the technologies that could have been used probably would have worked. Right. But the politics, as in most of the things in the United States and probably around the world, interferes and decides what's going to happen and how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. I, I'm glad that we are at the... Uh, Conclusion of this project, I look forward to meeting with all of you again and telling you that we're done and that would be great and that we're actually looking at, at full closure and what that will actually ultimately look like. Well, maybe we should have a big celebration in Washington, D.C. and certainly right. big celebration in The Hague. I think, yeah. uh, you know, we still have outstanding countries and stockpiles around the world at least the North Korean one, and maybe maybe one or two in the Middle East as well. Uh, and we still have some violators, as we know, that we haven't really talked about today. But um, yeah, you're right, Irene. It's a long time coming, but when it's done, it's an enormously wonderful program and model for abolition of a whole class of weapons of mass destruction. Yep. You know, with maybe, I think lessons, lessons learned, I'm sure, for Biological Weapons Convention, as well as for nuclear weapons as well. I think there are many lessons to learn. I think one of the things that we all learned from the very beginning is not to try and destroy the weapons in a vacuum, so to speak. Let the public in to know what's happening. Right. Uh, a few countries need to hear that, but we won't, <laughs> we won't have time to get into that right now. Yeah. Um, Brandy, final comments? Yeah, so... Um... First of all, I, I want to thank you all again for for allowing me to come in and speak with you all, and um, and I am I'm I'm very excited by the conversation, and I'm looking through the questions and answers uh, there on the right hand side, and it's just a bunch of great uh, questions that are coming up. Um, while I don't have the the time the, the history uh, and the time in in this program as as you and and Irene have had, you know, one thing that I just notice every single time I engage with this community um, is the dedication that everybody comes to the table with, um, and it's it's absolutely impressive to see, and it's and it's heartening to see, inspiring, frankly, to see that dedication that everybody has towards. Uh, you know, the Chemical Weapons Convention, OPCW, and, and especially our demilitarization program here in the U.S. Um, I, I think that I can say that we are going to be equally excited at the idea of completing this program. Uh, we, we do recognize uh, across the department the importance of completing this program and especially completing uh, the, the destruction on time. So again, by that September date, not the December date, 
Um, and I know we've got a couple of years to go, and I know that there's a lot of challenges ahead of us, especially in this COVID environment, uh, but we are all uh, very dedicated uh, and, and focused on uh, the mission ahead of us in the next couple of years, uh, and we will be very happy to get to the end um, and, and see what's going to be on the kind of the next program up uh, to focus on, whether it's the RCWM or something else. Um, but we are looking forward to it. And again, thank you all so much for allowing me to sit here with you all today. Well, thank you both. It's been a wonderful conversation, excellent presentations. Uh, we've had a, a big listener group all over the world. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, thank the Arms Control Association, Global Affairs Canada, uh, my colleagues, Daryl Kimball and Leanne Quinn and Tony Fleming and, uh, and many others, uh, the whole CWC coalition uh, who have, dedicated a good amount of their time towards seeing, helping to build the world free of chemical weapons. Uh, this will be, uh, this is recorded. This will be on the CWC Coalition and Arms Control Association websites, if I'm not mistaken, in the near future. Uh, and uh, please, if you have questions, uh, we'll try to follow up with any one of us. Uh, and uh, we'll continue keeping a close watch on this. And as the next Conference of States Party is the 20 sixth conference of state parties at the CWC takes place in um, last week of November, actually this year. Uh, so thank you all.